Okay guys, this video will go over a Seesaw Dispatch console connected to a Kenwood radio using a Telex IP224 interface. We're going to look at seven different points in the path and go over what you should expect to see and what test equipment you would use. A lot of these sections uh, have to be simplified for training purposes because um, they just take too long but it's important to recognize how uh, with complex systems like this um, you're using these paths for virtual wires so that you just you're trying to hook a microphone up to a radio and if you only had extra long wires you wouldn't need all this other equipment um, so in the at the end of the day uh, all of this equipment ends up being virtual wires uh, that allow you to uh, use the uh, uh, radios from a remote location um, but first before we get into each one of these points um, we need to go over the fundamentals of how computers uh, use sound cards uh, to convert analog sounds to digital data and then the reverse process uh, to convert digital data back to analog audio. Um, um, by the way, the, um, the Seesaw PC here is using the, the Telex ADHB4 as its sound card. Um, so, but let's get into the basics of uh, how, the, how the PCs work and um, we'll, um, we'll come back to the uh, Seesaw system here. Uh, and go from there and it'll make a lot more sense once you know uh, that process. So um, I'm going to use this diagram to, uh, to explain um, how the sampling process is done and this setup we're doing here um, you could do on your own uh, PC or laptop. Um, all we're doing is we're using a microphone and we're looping it back uh, by be using the uh, Windows feature in sound to listen to the device so we're just so that we just play it back on our own speakers um, and I'm going to go over the process uh, of how it does that how it takes the sound from the microphone runs it through the computer and back out so that you'll get a um, an understanding of how sampling is done okay if you look um, closer at the uh, the microphone setting here Let me pull this over you'll see that in the windows uh, when you go into the properties of the microphone it says uh, select the sample rate and bit depth to be used when running in shared mode so it, well, we, we have 16 bit 44,100 Hertz CD quality okay so wh what does that mean what does that practically mean how, how does that work well, what that means is, is that inside um, this uh, USB, just flare out all the way, uh, inside this USB sound card is a tiny little voltmeter. And it's a special voltmeter um, in that instead of having a normal display, it has a digital display, if you will. And this is a virtual voltmeter, obviously not one for a human being. But it's, uh, it's, it's range, um, depending on the exact specifications of the, of the sound card's microphone input, um, basically, um, you know, plus or minus uh, three, four volts uh, in, in the, that uh, territory. Um, and it takes this range uh, and splits it uh, into 65,536 different steps and um, it's what it's doing is every 23 microseconds it's making a measurement of this voltage and it's um, writing it down um, uh, on essentially uh, it's uh, uh, RAM uh, I'm illustrating that with a piece of paper here that it's writing the voltage uh, measurement down and every 23 microseconds it's sending this measurement out um, um, and 
let me talk about uh, I should mention where I get the 65,536 from and that's because we're uh, 16 bits of binary data if uh, 16 ones here that translates into a uh, decimal 65,535 so with all zeros you get uh, 65,536 possible um, um, slices here and they're in the microvolt range uh, each one of these adjustments um, uh, each one of these measurements it makes but it's a 16 digit number and like I said every 23 microseconds it's recorded down and uh, it's a snapshot it's not a AC voltmeter it's a DC voltmeter and it's measuring at that absolute instant in time where it crosses on the um, on the line um, uh, where it comes across but um, so the analog audio goes in gets translated into uh, these 16-bit uh, uh, words coming in every 23 microseconds. Now in the microprocessor here, um, it, it's uh, got the simplest job of the world because it doesn't have to do anything with this the way we have it except take it and send it right back out, uh, back along the USB bus, uh, back to the sound card. So the sound card gets this, um, um, the same 16-bit words that were coming in are coming right back out. Now on the other side of the sound card, so half the sound card is a DC voltmeter. On the other half of the sound card is a DC power supply. And the special thing about this DC power supply is, is that you can adjust the voltage on it extremely precisely and extremely fast and in this particular case just like on the voltmeter we have 65,536 possible um, adjustment steps that it can make and it can be adjusted um, every 23 microseconds um, um, uh, just like our measurement here so and when you go to look at the um, audio let me zoom in so, so you can kind of see the effect um, here is our pure analog audio coming in and essentially this is what we have coming out now um, you can see the ragged uh, edges of the sawtooth with each one of these is a another power supply adjustment uh, because the DC can only make uh, adjustments that way now there are uh, other things that we can do electronically to help smooth this out but um, when it comes to um, this uh, process of sampling and how good is good and what's the best and how much is it, it is required it's all about the human ear and it's about uh, how how detailed do you have to be before the human ear can no longer tell the difference um, that it doesn't matter if you sampled three times the speed or uh, took a lot more uh, broader range of, uh, of bits you know, where you went 24 bits instead of 16 bits um, the human ear just doesn't have the capacity to to make out the difference so for all um, intents and purposes the way we do uh, audio uh, for unless you're an audiophile um, and like I said you can see it's a CD quality um, this is how the uh, uh, the general uh, internal world of uh, Windows and all the programs like uh, CSoft and everything that might run on it these are the 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 end audio buses that they're going to end up dealing with they're going to end up dealing with sound coming in and it's going to be uh, the sound is going to be 16 bits and it's going to be coming in every 23 microseconds um, and it's going to be an actual pure sample um, of the waveform it's not going to be um, some kind of uh, representation or theory about it it's going to be a real okay in this drawing we're uh, 
we're taking the uh, connection in the previous one and we're uh, doing it now between two computers and uh, we're using the Ethernet connection uh, between the two computers to transport the 16-bit data words um, from the uh, uh, microphone computer over to now the speaker computer uh, downrange here and that resulting uh, stream is going to result in a, a 700,000 bits per second um, output that we're going to need to put into Ethernet packets to take along here. Um, that's a lot of data um, and it, uh, when, especially when these systems uh, first came out uh, like with CSOF and Telex, uh, uh, bandwidth was extremely expensive and they did they wanted to do everything they could to limit the amount of uh, bandwidth um, that they used the, to transport sound from one device to the other and um, a lot of it uh, ended up doing with um, uh, the making uh, sacrifices in quality um, uh, lessening the range of audio the, the uh, frequency range and also the amount of fidelity and the uh, the ups and downs in the levels that it could uh, listen to um, but this is showing you your setup and if we didn't do anything with the audio at all that it would end up uh, occupying um, this amount of uh, bandwidth to get between the two computers so um, we're going to look at um, what they what they decided to do about that um, and here we see our, our original setup here with our original stream. So what we, what we needed to do was we needed to take um, that, uh, that stream and somehow uh, reduce it. And they came up with this um, uh, mathematical formula uh, to manipulate the data uh, back in the 70s. Um, and they, uh, it's, it's called a codec, and it stands for a, a coder decoder. Um, and it's um, basically um, a, an algorithm that takes um, the, the original sound um, that's coming in at 16 bits and 44,000 uh, hertz sample and reduces it down to an 8 bit 8000 hertz output and it does this uh, through a variety of methods um, um, data methods and also other um, uh, speech uh, patterns uh, things that they they came up with it's 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 actually quite complex it's it's not a really easy thing um, world but Anyway, um, uh, and I'll go a little bit more into that in just a sec, but it, it, that's what it's doing is it's using software to take a, a high speed, high bit input and reduce it down. Now, once you reduce it down to eight bits, uh, 8,000 uh, hertz uh, cycle, now all you need to do in your ethernet packets is transfer uh, these eight bit words every 125 microseconds instead of uh, 16 every 23 so um, and because your Ethernet um, packets need some overhead bits you end up um, you end up using 82 uh, kilobytes 82,000 kilobytes uh, total Ethernet bandwidth uh, to get the 64,000 across but it's essentially a um, um, uh, 10 for 1 um, uh, savings if you will you can uh, by using this software now you can run 10 conversations across the same bandwidth that you would uh, only be able to run one conversation with if you didn't use that software at all so that translates in the business world to a lot of money especially back in the day when these um, when these these connections really were very very expensive uh, for a small amount of bandwidth um, so this was your um, uh, your first initial big 
uh, attempt at uh, using a software program to help you squeeze this down as much as you can. And of course, when it, it squeezes it down on one end, it takes it at the other end and blows it back up again so that the 8 bit 8000 input comes back out into the normal audio. And when you, you look at, well, what were the sacrifices that they make? Well, the sacrifices they made were in the range of frequencies that they could listen to. So um, in, a, in a music uh, CD, you could have frequencies going up to 20,000 hertz. But in the, the G711 codec, it stops uh, audio at 3,400 hertz. Uh, it keeps it between 300 and 3400 the voice range so it filters out the lows and the highs and it also doesn't take um, uh, quite as accurate um, uh, uh, sampling of the voltage I believe it's either 13 or 14 bit uh, sample that it takes and then it does some tricky mathematics to take that and then squeeze that down to 8 bits so, um, but it's for, um, uh, th this particular codec is run in just about all the, the, the digital phones in the world. Uh, it's been around for a long time and the humans just can't, um, it's clear enough that people don't complain. It, it sounds good enough it, it, to the human ear and that's, that's all they, they cared about. Now, um. There was a time, like I said, when this first came out, and this was a, a lot of money that um, someone um, um, finally said, well, you know what? Uh, if we could squeeze this down even more, we could get, instead of um, uh, uh, 10 extra calls, what if we could get 20 uh, for the space that would take one? Look at how much money we, we saved then. And that uh, led to the development of the um, of the uh, from G7 and it led over to the uh, G726 which started at 721 but um, it, it's using a um, once again some fancy mathematics and computer programming to do some manipulation of the original uh, G711 and some uh, what they call some, uh, as you can see, it, it, it's, they do some predictive uh, stuff and, and other kind of uh, uh, tricks, but they squeeze it down once again uh, to four bits uh, at 8,000 hertz um, instead of eight bits. And that gives you a resultant of 32 kilobits uh, out, and that's what our uh, selection on our Telex uh, devices are. Um, 32 and with the uh, the overhead on the, with the Ethernet uh, packets that ends up being uh, 50 kilobits uh, per second um, so and once again you have to sacrifice a little bit more audio when you squeeze down from G711 down to G726 you're you're taking a little bit uh, further hit into the voice quality of um, your sampling and the resultant audio so um, it's um, kind of a thing to where like I said this was this meant a lot of money back in the day nowadays with uh, gigabit um, Ethernet pipes the quibbling about 32 kilobits seems ridiculous um, and it, it is depending on which system you're in but uh, that's that's what it is so for us um, in our modern world with our stuff uh, that we we should definitely be running 711 not 726 we there we have we have a few radios with with a few PCs on a, a, a on almost a empty um, a, a fiber optic pipe so uh, no problem with that and it and, the, and you can hear the difference in audio quality when you do it. And uh, just to clarify something while we're in the subject, because it is very confusing. When you look into the, um, the, the programming options and everything, they talk about vocoder type. 
and you hear this word vocoder a lot. And it turns out the word vocoder was coined back in the 30s, um, the 1930s, and um, it just basically meant uh, voice coding. And um, it's uh, it covered a lot of different things, uh, techniques and stuff. Um, but as the years went by, um, it, it got to be meaning something a little bit more specifically different and it can be confusing and and I wanted to show you this so um, you understand the differences uh, between the two. Um, technically our um, ones that the, the, the codecs that we're using in the Telex devices which are the G711 and the G726 um, those are the uh, 711 is the PCM and then the 726 is the 80 PCM. These are technically um, uh, waveform coders. They're not vocoders. Um, remember there was a back in the old days vocoders covered all this stuff but I'll go into what's why they have their own name now that's different. But for uh, like I said our telex devices we're, we're waveform coders and what waveform cord, uh, coders do is they, they, they look at the actual sine wave and they're trying to duplicate it. They're, they're just plodding along and they're not thinking anything other than I'm just following the, the waveform and I'm trying to duplicate it. Um, vocoders, um, vocoders are a completely different world and they got their beginnings in life when we started coming up with our the DSP chips, the digital signal processing chips, which are the uh, the fancy um, big microprocessor based um, uh, audio chips that can do pretty much anything that you want with audio. And what someone had the idea for was is that instead of trying when we go to sample audio and and trying. Um, uh, look at it and reduplicate it at the other end. What if they took a completely different way of looking at uh, of how to do it and instead looked at, uh, uh, and this is on stuff that just involved human speech, radios, telephones, those kind of things where you're not wanting to play any music, you're not wanting to play tones, you're not wanting to play anything but just human speech. And that they found that if they look at the structure of the human throat, and the way our throat makes sounds that they could take the uh, an analog uh, uh, human voice input and do some um, crazy math to sample it and essentially resynthesize it at the other end uh, with those uh, same patterns and it's got nothing to do with looking at the uh, the actual waveform in real time it's got to do with what the sound represents digitally to a uh, chip that has a human throat filter in it if you will and um, so and these were the things that were having really hard times with um, uh, air mask and breathing apparatuses that firefighters use and stuff because of the uh, um, it was the the muffled sounds that were coming out of the mask were different from the human voice enough to where it was messing up all the algorithms that were doing its thing in the chips. So, but anyway, didn't want to spend too long on that. But uh, yes, technically the 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 codecs that we are selecting from are not vocoders, uh, but they are vocoders in the bigger picture of the definition from the 1930s. So hope that clears things up for you. Uh, okay, back to the uh, original drawing here. We're gonna go ahead and look at each one of these points and go through the um, signal flow from microphone all the way through to the radio. So let's start at point number one and go from there. Okay, 
We're now looking at uh, point number one, which is where the desk mic uh, plugs into the back of the ADHB4. Now, um, when you're looking at the, uh, the microphone, it's obviously always best, if you, if you can, to have a backup microphone ready to go, a known good backup microphone, so that it's not a big uh, uh, troubleshooting process. Um, in case something goes wrong, you can quickly half split the problem um, by putting in your replacement mic. Um, but let's just take a look at the ADHB four, and uh, like I said, it's it's acting as a uh, sound card for the PC, and uh, it's got the same two basic uh, input uh, or connections here. You got a, a microphone input and then a speaker output. Um, when it comes to the 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 microphone here, we have a push to talk. Um, switch that can um, initiate the um, uh, transmission and there's also a push to talk button on the PC uh, display and they can initiate uh, conversation as well when it's the push to talk on the button um, on the mic here uh, when you do the the push to talk it comes into here and it's going to end up sending a uh, communications to the USB port to the main uh, telex program letting it know that there's a push to talk request um, so there's going to be some kind of uh, internal language between this uh, device and the uh, program on the um, PC um, as far as the audio is concerned um, I'm just going to take a guess and it's it'll be something similar to the standard 44 uh, one um, audio um, with the 16-bit uh, uh, sampling uh, going on the once again out the USB um, uh, outlet here and um, but I don't know for sure um, they're kind of secretive about their box. You can't really get any information about it inside uh, Windows. It just it's just kind of a random device that shows up there. They don't have a normal um, sound card uh, um, um, area where you could look at um, uh, the settings and whatnot. It's kind of proprietary, I'm guessing. But uh, anyway, here at the uh, at the ADHB. This is where you get to uh, select what kind of mic. They got several different models of microphones that you can use. And this is also where you can adjust the gain, um, how loud the uh, microphone sounds. Um, some of the older models also have um, a screw hole in the bottom with a little pot that you can adjust uh, the gain as well. Um, some of the other things that uh, to, if you're questioning whether you have a bad microphone or not, if it's working. Um, there's always the VU display on your main, on your main uh, console, uh, and it's this bar graph that will show your voice, and you should be able to, uh, with a good strong voice uh, into the mic, you should be able to come up here and make it hit some reds. Uh, if you notice that when you hit it, no matter how you yell into it, and it's only going a uh, third of the way or not halfway then you probably got a dead microphone um, uh, where the, maybe water got into the element or something um, but it also has uh, um, on this uh, DB15 connector out the back uh, it has a 600 ohm audio output for uh, logging recording uh, that you can look at it's a 600 ohm uh, output so as you can hook up a uh, Tim's or a oscilloscope if you're really wanting to look look at it uh, in depth But like I said main part is just uh, trying to keep a spare microphone if you can and um, While I got it here this um, uh, These adjustments in this selection is uh, contained within the 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 web-based uh, browser um, um, for the uh, ADHB here, that's what the um, 
the Ethernet connection does. It just allows you to get in to, to do the programming. No, uh, no sound packets come in or out of the, uh, I shouldn't say uh, in because it, it gets all the other things, but it, this is not producing any uh, um, uh, packets for sound coming out. It's simply to allow you to get access to the, the web-based uh, programming screen here. So, but um, anyway, let's, uh, let's move on and take a look at uh, the next point. This is point number two, which is going to be the input to the USB connection um, of the, the CSOF uh, PC. Now, like I said before, the, they're pretty secretive about um, their, their goings on inside the PC as far as the ADHD. Uh, uh, pretty much the only thing that you can see on it is when you if if you come down and click on your uh, remove hardware uh, little icon here at the bottom you'll see where it gives you the option to eject it so you know that the computer has it sees it and it's plugged in it just doesn't really want to tell you about anything about it uh, but we just know it, it is acting as a um, as a sound card and um, there is uh, no other built-in sound card as well um, um, that's accessible uh, when you go into the programming. It just shows nothing there, no, no, no mic or speakers. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, so there's not a whole lot of action here. Uh, if you had a problem here, um, the, the program would squawk about it. You would... You would see a lost connection indication and you wouldn't see this so there would be no doubt about uh, what was going on there so let's move on to position number three okay so this is going to be looking out at the output of the Seasoft uh, PC and it's looking at it um, utilizing the, the, the switch that's that's uh, uh, the PC is connected to uh, just using an empty port because these are um, UDP, UDP broadcast packets um, they pretty much go out everything uh, to, they're meant to go uh, to everyone on the LAN um, so um, it's not address specific if, when you look at the address of where they're sent it to this 226 it's, it's I should say it's a phony address, but it's a it's an address that's not none of the equipment out here actually has this address in it. But everyone understands that uh, when it's been sent to one of these addresses, that it's for it's like a party line on a telephone. It's for everyone to uh, listen to. So we got a we got a, our laptop here, and we're going to be um, uh, using it uh, with three different programs: Wireshark. Uh, VLC and Audacity. Wireshark where you, we can use to actually look at the uh, packets that are coming out and confirm that they are on the uh, um, they have the right addressing and format um, within the uh, CSOF programming here in the, the, the line settings you can see the uh, where they got the the individual numbers that you're going to want to be looking for in this case it's going to be our transmits uh, which is what will be coming out of the PC and those are uh, 7071 uh, the port uh, for the packet and under the options tab is where you get to pick the the vocoder type in this case we're using the G711 so um, when the um, um, Anytime the, uh, there's a push to talk, um, these packets start coming out of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the NIC card here. And it's um, going to be a 64K uh, 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 bits per stream, uh, uh, bits per second stream, which ends up taking 82 kilobits of Ethernet bandwidth. And um, like we went over in the previous uh, video, uh, 
part. And um, but anyway, the Wireshark will uh, uh, you know, let us see this information in real time. We can see the packets flying by. And I did a, a previous video to this one where I could sh I showed how using the um, streaming uh, media player VLC uh, you can capture the packets that are coming out and save them to file and then you can use the uh, audio program audacity to uh, take that raw data file and convert it to an mp3 or a WAV file uh, so you can uh, listen play back the audio uh, if you wanted to confirm what was coming out was uh, uh, good but um, anyway um, this is, uh, like I said, this is number three, and this is right out the, uh, uh, what would be looking at coming out of the uh, Seesaw console. Now let's move on. Uh, okay, we're at number four. This spot was um, uh, two different spots. It was essentially back where we were just at and also at the other switch. Either one of them, when you're, when you're hanging out at this spot and everything's working, you'll see traffic coming and going in both directions. So as the Kenwood radio receives uh, traffic and audio comes out of its receiver, it will go into the um, 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 IP224, get digitized, that audio will be digitized and it'll get sent out uh, going toward the Seasoft and um, vice versa when there's a push to talk and uh, uh, audio, uh, transmit audio is heading toward the radio, it'll come back in the other direction. And you can, um, uh, this PC being in the middle, the laptop here being in the middle, uh, we'll see, see both sides of the traffic going and you could record um, in either direction, look at it in either direction and just confirm uh, if there's problems uh, at either side, whether um, uh, from the uh, uh, other equipment or for, for, for from the um, uh, something to do with the uh, connections between uh, the equipment going on the land, so that's a that's a that's a that's a convenient spot to be at. But um, let's uh, move on to the next one here, and. Uh, and this is spot number five and this is going to be um, once again looking from just exclusively from the uh, IP224 perspective and what's coming out of it going toward the Seasoft and once again we're using our laptop to look at the um, using Wireshark and VLC and Audacity to look at the output with the specifics being determined within the programming of the Telex IPT24, where we have our vocoder type and the port that we're going to be sending packets um, address out. Um, in in this case, because everything is related to which direction of the the two-way radio is involved, uh, when audio comes out of the radio it'll be, the packs will be broadcast um, for port 6071, um, which on the other side of uh, the Seasoft console is um, programmed to be uh, receiving those packets. So that's how it gets back in the other direction. So once again, this is a, a laptop being used to, to help isolate any troubles if you wanted to uh, if you thought one was uh, having trouble getting out um, specifically. And you could actually um, even bypass the switch by using a crossover cable, um, a crossover Ethernet cable, and you could connect directly to the uh, IP224 and just be a little mini, mini um, network of consisting of you and the IP224. And it'll still, uh, regardless, uh, send out the, the UDB packets because they're not addressed to anyone in particular. Uh, they're just broadcast. 
But okay, let's move, uh, keep it uh, going and look at the next step. Okay, we're here at um, spot number six, which is going to be the, the connection between the IP224 and the Kenwood radio. Um, we have uh, 10 wires uh, going back and forth. We have the push a talk. We have COR. We have transmit audio, receive audio. And we have the four uh, frequency control lines uh, for channel steering to change channels um, on the radio. Now, um, the audio levels coming out of here are standard uh, zero dBm. Um, so, um, the only exception to that uh, in this case is because this is a, a like a mobile radio and it's not really intended for for um, uh, kind of vault work, if you will. But uh, so it's it's transmit in is not 600 ohm. You have to put, uh, install a 10k ohm resistor uh, to get the uh, um, the deviation in the correct uh, window so that it'll adjust properly. But um, other than that, um, all of these are just your standard analog connections, and you would use um, um, your TIMS uh, to measure the levels or generate tones, um, your uh, multimeter here to confirm your your signaling, your push to talk, and your COR, and anything that you have there. And if you're suspecting uh, any kind of distorted audio um, issues, you can use an oscilloscope to have a look at your analog uh, transmit or receive audio. So this is um, kind of like where um, a good spot to, to measure and um, uh, when you're sending tones back and forth and you're doing your, your, your adjustments, it's a good uh, split point. Uh, I'd recommend having a DB25 breakout um, block so that you could hook up uh, this end and uh, isolate and um, get a, a good uh, voltmeter um, test point so that uh, you don't have to try and get in here and take a hood off or try and probe with uh, your probes in here at the pins. But um, yeah, so this is where it all breaks down. Um, there are um, some places that uh, where they actually had for other interface purposes, the output uh, coming out of here was set up for a four wire tone remote. And then they would go to a DSP223 adapter first. And then out of that DSP223 adapter, you would get your 10 wire uh, connection to the radio and that was um, uh, had to do with uh, like I said interface and with another system uh, that was used to having four wire um, uh, audio to do what it needed to do um, but yep so this is the this is the the, the last part of the uh, radio before it goes to the the RF output so let's take a look at that one And here we're, uh, we're finally hooked up with our service monitor to the uh, transmitter output where we can get our uh, power and deviation and frequency error measurements and all that good stuff. And uh, this is a good spot to um, bring up, well, how do you get this, how do you get the, the levels centered and, and, and uh, uh, referenced? And on your uh, console, you could program uh, some tone buttons, which I highly recommend you do, uh, where you can get uh, this one, which would be a, a zero dB um, alert, which give you full deviation. And if everything is uh, uh, adjusted right and you're at the, the proper spot of uh, your knee of compression there, um, when you you set up another uh, of the same tone at 6 dB down, you should get half deviation. So if, you're, um, if your setup this way 
and you go 60 B down and you're still deviating uh, more you know you only went down two from 2.5 to 2 or uh, didn't go down at all or whatever then you know that you're um, you're you're too high already and you're in compression because you should you should see this linear drop of um, of half your deviation when uh, for 6 dB drop in level but uh, this is kind of like your final final stop um, on the path and um, you can uh, this is a little bit difficult because you need a, some assistance from dispatch uh, on the other side to operate these buttons for you um, but um, this is where you can uh, establish if you're if these aren't working you can go back to uh, um, the other spots and do your adjustments there until it gets into tune that's kind of how i found out about installing the 10k ohm resistor uh, before but um so um this is the um uh, like i said we the round trip um uh, all the way all the way here now when it comes to going back the other direction for the receive audio it's the same exact process but in reverse um there's no difference at all um just this uh, just the other direction that's all it is so all right well um there's your complete uh tour i hope that helps you out and uh we'll see you on the next video